Hi, everybody. Sorry that I'm a few minutes late. Um, I didn't realize that my computer was going to need to restart, so it just slowed me down a little bit. So hopefully you are here now and you are seeing that this YouTube is live. And I am just going to post the link to this in Schoology. Um, so here we go. I am not, um, my internet is a little bit slow right now. Sorry. Okay, I'm here. What questions do you have? I'm seeing no questions. Ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies. I'm assuming it's going to take you a little bit longer to get into this because um, I am just going live right now. So. Let's post this on Schoology while you are thinking. Technology is not with me today, people. Ha ha. Okay. Reese asked for some of the important dates to remember. Um, I don't think this is a particularly date heavy section. I think you need to remember the years of the big revolutions. So in the Italian peninsula, we have the revolution of 1820 in Naples and uh, Sicily. We have a revolution of 1830 in France and the Italian states, and also in Belgium, but we didn't really talk about that. And we have a revolution in 1848, really everywhere except for England and Russia. And then um, you should know in 1848, the March days in Austria, the June days in France, and then you should know the date of German unification, which is January 18th, 1861. I also find it useful to know the dates of each of the wars of Italian and German unification. So the Austro-Sardinian War uh, in 1858, and then um, unification is basically complete in 1860 in Italy with... Um, Venetia being added in 1866 and Rome being added in 1870. The wars of German unification are 1864 for the Danish war, 1866 for the Austro-Prussian war and 1870-71 for the Franco-Prussian war. With uh, German unification being complete then on January 18th, 1871. Um, Cake Master Andy, I assume that's just Andy, as we know her, asked to talk about the Danish War of 1864. So to do that, I'm going to point at my map. So do you see this little green country sticking out here? Ooh, it's hard to point backwards. Right here, straight above Germany, that's Denmark. Um, between Denmark and Germany, it was a part of Denmark at the time, there was a territory called Schleswig-Holstein, which we practice saying in class. And Schleswig-Holstein was, uh, had been independent German states, had been taken by Denmark in 1848. And in eight, the Danish War of 1864, Austria and Prussia formed an alliance trying to reclaim what they saw as that German territory from the Danes. So Austria and Prussia fought together against the Danes. And as a result of that war, Prussia took Schleswig, which is further north, and Austria to Holstein, which is a bit further south. Um, they border each other. And then two years later, Prussia really just wanting to get rid of Austrian dominance of the German states, um, oh, pardon me, went to war with Austria over Holstein. 
So first Prussia gets Schleswig from the Danes in 1864, and then they get Holstein uh, from the Austrians in 1866. And more importantly, will push Austria out of the dominant position in the German states. Um, okay, and then Andy also asked about the Kulturkampf, uh, the effects of it specifically. So the Kulturkampf is the anti-Catholic legislation in Germany. Um, the effects of that are largely that the state will take over a lot of the roles that the Catholics had held in the German states previous to that. So, um, for instance, they will kick all of the Jesuits out of Austria and um, that's going to put like education and marriage in the hand of the state instead of in the hand of the Catholic Church. Um, I'm not sure that we talk, I mean, there's other effects, but I'm not sure we talked about other effects. Um, also, there's a lot of Catholic migration out of Germany. I think we talked about that. And it's really going to help to consolidate the north and south of Germany because the northern part of Germany is largely Protestant and the southern part, especially in Bavaria, is largely Catholic. So I think by getting the church out of a lot of those politics, it's going to allow Catholics. Well, I wouldn't say that they're really supportive of this policy, but um, the hope was that they would, um, you know, have loyalty to this to the state before the church. Um, Luis says he's here, so cool. Reese asked for me to go over Ely and his beliefs. So to understand what Jeff Ely was saying in the article you guys read, you have to understand what Valer was saying, I think, first. So Valer said that Germany um, developed on this special path, or Sonderweg, and that the Sonderweg led German modernization to kind of go wrong, that 1848's failure led to this rise in authoritarian rule that you see under Bismarck. He says it's a Bonapartist dictatorship, so it's charismatic, plebiscitary, and authoritarian. And um, as a result of that going wrong, um, Germany won't really have a liberal tradition and therefore will not really know how to behave in a modern liberal state, and therefore um, that will lead to the rise of the Nazis. So Ely says that doesn't make any sense, um, that within an authoritarian state, there was actually quite a bit of liberal reform that the, um, the Samlung policy that Baylor talks about, this uh, cooperation between um, the Junkers, the aristocratic um, Prussians, landed Prussian aristocrats, and the liberal capitalists actually leads to quite a lot of liberal reform, that you have a lot of capitalistic developments in Germany. Um, and Ely talks about the ways in which capitalists were able to, and liberals were able to gain a lot of those things without necessarily having a lot of political power in the Reichstag, which is the German parliament. Um, so for instance, a lot of the socialist policies, the anti-socialist policies that Bismarck passes, is actually kind of good for liberals. Um, so that's how Ely says that um, Baylor's special path doesn't really make sense. The other thing he says is that it's only a special path if you consider it in relation to Britain and France, that we can't take them as the norm or as the sort of like only way that development can happen. He says that Germany only looks unusual if you think of England and France as the norm. It's not that they took a special path to modernization. They definitely just took a different path but that doesn't make it wrong. So hopefully that covers Ely. Um, Andy asked about Ferdinand the <coughs> third. Excuse me. Um, Ferdinand the third is the Bourbon King of Naples in um, the southern part of the Italian peninsula. He's the restored Bourbon King who's put back on the throne after the French Revolution. Luis said, oh, the British and the Italian interpretations. Um, can we hold off on that for a second? And let me do the June days first, just because I need to think about the British and Italian 
um, thing just a second. And I also just want to make sure that this link posted correctly on sort of correctly. Um, okay, so uh, June days in 1848. So 1848 in France really has two phases. It starts in February because the recession in 1847 had been so bad. Unemployment was super, super high in the German states in 1848. And they had these um, banquets in Paris. And the banquets were sort of like enlightenment salons where people could get together and talk about how they were going to fix things. Um, and it was also a place just for people to voice their opinions. Um, Louis Philippe thought that these banquets were a threat to him and he was nervous about them. So he closed them. So that's kind of an act of censorship, right? Um, there was... Nobody was happy about this. So then the revolution breaks out in February of 1848. That's then going to spread to Austria and everywhere else in the rest of 1848. And um, Louis Philippe will abdicate the throne. So that's the first part of the revolution, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's, it's kind of contested. See, I'm all wrapped in a blanket because it's still cold in my basement. Um, it's kind of contested because... Um, who's going to be in control then? They haven't chosen a new government. And so in for the rest of the year in 1848, there's going to be quite a lot of uncertainty and instability. So in June, that instability breaks out in... Uh, I should put my hair back so I can think. Um, in June of 1848... Um, there's going to be more riots in the street. It's called the bloody June days because of all of the violence in the street. Um, a general will come in and kind of squash that. And then Louis Napoleon will be elected in December of 1848. So the June days is just sort of violent uprisings in Paris in 1848, which was, that was a very long way to answer that question. Sorry, Eric. Um, utopian socialism is the, um, like Saint-Simon and Robert Owen, um, you guys did this when you were looking at your isms chart, if you guys have that. Um, just looking up this, uh, okay. Um, so utopian socialists aren't communists. They're not trying to violently overthrow the state. They're just talking about socialist reforms that will improve lives of the workers. So the reason that they call them utopian is that they're talking about creating these sort of utopian societies. So Robert Owen, for instance, wanted to create um, uh, New Harmony, Indiana, or he did create New Harmony, Indiana, which would basically be like a factory town where they would also have schools for the workers' children, where they would have maybe medical care for the workers and they would have housing and everyone, the workers would split the profits of the company, but everyone would sort of be cared for by the company. Um, Enrico Misley is in your, he was one of the ones that I said was kind of obscure but I think that he's worth knowing just to be able to name drop on your IB exam. And he is, we, look, we looked up the page number at school and now I don't have the page number. Oh, I think it's 1830. He led the revolts in Parma, Modena. So let me get to that section here and I'll tell you what page it's on in your Italian packet. Yes, Enrico Misli um, led the revolutions in Modena um, in 1831-32. Um, he was, he, he thought that his ruler would sort of help him unify Italy or that he could unify under him. Um, but then he, instead he was arrested before the uprising was supposed to begin. Um, there's a little bit there about the effects of him too. Uh, Radetsky, Luis, we said in class, you can uh, cross that off the list. Um, Simon, Louis Kossuth is the Magyar nationalist in um, Hungary who starts the 
nationalist element of the Austrian 1848 revolution? Um, oh, 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 oh. Sorry, German Socialist Party. Yeah, Miller, you just need to know that the German Socialist Party is um, increase their popularity is increasing uh, after unification, and Bismarck is really nervous about the power of the party. And so he passes the anti-socialist laws. And one of the things, rather than outright banning the socialist party, he just, um, it's like he cut off their arms and legs. So he said they weren't allowed to meet. They weren't allowed to publish newspapers. Um, he forbid trade unions. And I feel like I'm missing one piece there from that definition, but I can't think what it is. Um, oh, and then he gave the socialists, he, he gave the workers everything that the socialists were pushing for. So universal health care, disability insurance, and age old pension. And then like if the whole party platform has already been solved, what are the socialists going to work for? It's not the whole party platform, but it's a lot. So it made the workers happy. So that's kind of Bismarck's realpolitik genius. Um, Charles Felix an example of something that he did was just that he asked the Austrians for control or for help to help squash some liberal grumblings in Piedmont. Uh, I'm not sure how long he ruled for you, but I'm sure you can Google that quickly. Andy, why don't you Google that? And then um, I'll say the dates out loud because I don't know off the top of my head what years he ruled. Um, there was something I was going to go back to and I don't remember. <laughs> Oh, I know what it was. Uh, you know what? It was the Italian and British interpretations of unification. And I'm not actually sure that I have that part of the packet here scanned. Let me see. Does somebody want to take a stab at that? And I'll see what I can remember to try to add it without referring back to my notes. Oh, so Charles Felix ruled from 1821 to 1831, which makes sense because those are both revolutionary years. Okay, let me just see if I've got this unification packet scan, the whole thing scan. Ah. I don't see it. Oh, here it is. Yes, I do. Unification of Italy part two, I called it. Okay, so that's the very last two or three pages of your packet. And just, I mean, I don't know what there is to tell you here. It's just a summary job. So you just need to understand how their interpretations differ. Um, so, um, Risorgimento is just the Italian word for the resurgence of Rome. Um, in Italy, that idea that this was like this big revolutionary project is kind of central, that it's like this idea of Italian unification as somewhat heroic and magnificent because it's this kind of national rebirth. Um, Italians really think about the leaders, these patriotic leaders, and this was definitely sure, true in that Italian unification museum, like the real one in Rome. Um, that Cavour, Garbaldi, Victor Emmanuel II, and Mazzini kind of led this heroic charge. Um, and then the non-Italian historians, or the British in this case, um, are less focused on the heroes um, and more interested, I think, in the idea that it was... Um, that, what are they saying here? That Cavour sort of ended up unifying Italy because in reaction to Garibaldi, that Garibaldi's actions kind of forced him into action, not as part of some master plan. Um, the British tend to be uh, more focused on sort of specific events rather than this kind of big picture idea. Um, 
that it was more of a revolution from above uh, with Piedmont kind of forcing it on the Italians uh, versus this idea of like this Italian rebirth or this movement from below. So hopefully that kind of covers that. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm just looking at what Andy and Luis wrote here. So basically the British say, um, yeah, and Andy, I think like, so Risorgimento, I think you need to think of that as like a popular movement too, right? So the, the Italians see it as more of a popular movement uh, with a lot of popular support for the big heroes and very idealistic and kind of romantic, whereas the British see it as more sort of practical and more something like this political thing that was forced on the Italians. I don't think the British thought the Risorgimento was unnecessary or a mess necessarily. Um, just that, and this is in response to Luis, just that it was not necessarily didn't have the popular support. Okay, what else have I missed here? 1848 revolutions in the Italian states versus in the German states. So if you think of 1848 as a... Uh, you know, you've got the French doing their thing, right? And that's really about trying to get more, um, more suffrage, more expanded suffrage, um, and a looser constitution or a stronger constitution that will control the things that the king can do. Um, so more of a liberal movement in the Italian and in Austria, it's also in Austria in particular, it's also got a lot of that happening in Vienna, that they want a constitution, which they don't have because they have the Habsburgs who are, um, you know, kind of the, the stalwart conservatives. Um, but Austria also has this nationalist movement with the Magyars looking to, so if the Austrian empire is this whole big piece, right? And the Magyars are like this big chunk of it. They're like, hey, we wanna have a vote within this larger piece. So what they're kind of looking for is some autonomy, some ability to make their own decisions. They will get that. We haven't talked about it yet, but Austria-Hungary is a thing by the time we get to World War I, right? It's not just Austria anymore. It's Austria-Hungary. They have a dual monarchy by then. Um, so 1848 is kind of the beginning of that. 1848 leads to Metternich fleeing Vienna, um, mostly because of violence in the streets. And then as the Austrians are having all this chaos, that means they can't squash the Italian states as much anymore. So the Italian liberal movements are inspired by all of this. And um, you see Italian, you see revolutions across the Italian states in Milan, in Rome. Um, I think they mentioned, mentioned some other regions in your packet as well. But um, a push to one, get rid of Austrian control and two, put into place uh, constitutional monarchies in all of those states. It goes so far as to create a Roman Republic in Rome in 1848 with Mazzini at the head and Garibaldi at the sword, of course, um, defending the uh, Republic against any invasion. But once the Austrians get their revolution under control, by 1849, they're sending troops back into the Italian states to squash all of that. So, um, and then also you've got other people coming in to defend the Catholics. So the French send in troops to defend the Pope in 1871. Um, and basically 1848 in Italy falls apart just like it did everywhere else. The liberals weren't particularly organized in their goals. Um, yeah, they wanted constitutional monarchies, but it's not like liberals in Milan were working with liberals in Rome. You've just got all of these very separate revolutions happening. Um, and so it's easier for the more unified conservative forces to come in and, and put down that, those uprisings. Okay, I think I hit that. Battle of Sedan is the final battle of the Franco-Prussian War where Napoleon would um, offer his surrender. And yeah, that's about all we say about that. It's in 1871. Expedition of the Thousand in the South was uh, Garibaldi's thousands or Garibaldi's red shirts were to um, liberate Italy from foreign control. So in the South to <clears throat> overthrow their Bourbon monarchs. Um, physical locations you should know. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Andy. Like, 
Are you asking if there's a map portion? Because the answer to that is no. I kind of meant to, I just forgot to put it on. So we didn't go over it, so I'm not gonna sweat it. Uh, the Napoleonic Code. So you have to think of Napoleon in two ways. On the one hand, he kind of leads to the birth of nationalism in the Italian states because he unifies Italy for the first time since the fall of Rome. Um, but at the same time, he's a foreign invader, right? He's French, he's not Italian. So the Napoleonic Code is gonna be one of those unifying Italian forces. He's bringing in a standardized legal practice. Um, he's, he's bringing the ideas of the revolution into the Italian states of liberty, equality, fraternity. And um, so that's gonna have a big lasting impact on the Italian states. Like would there have been revolutions in 1820, 1830, 1848 without those French revolutionary ideas and laws being in place? Maybe not. And would they have had this uprising of national sentiment without wanting to get rid of a foreign invader? Also maybe not. So the Napoleonic Code is going to bring those French revolutionary ideals into the Italian peninsula. Uh, Napoleon committed the Ems dispatch because he wanted the French to declare war on Prussia and then he could, um, then the Franco-Prussian War would start, he could bring the Southern states under uh, Prussian leadership and unify Germany and wouldn't have to deal with the French. He just didn't want to look like the bad guy because if he attacked the French, then the rest of like Europe and other uh, Britain and other countries would see him as an aggressor and that wouldn't be good for his plans. Um, Andy asked if I would talk about the Zulfurine. Um, the Zulfurine is just that economic portion of German unification that happens real early Oh, I can't remember the date that it's completed, but it's like, eight, excuse me, 1820s and 30s. Um, and Sulfurine just is the German customs union, so you don't have to pay a tax across each border. Garibaldi's March North is when Garibaldi's trying to get rid of the, that's what I was saying about Garibaldi's thousands. And it's so successful that Gabor's like, oh, holy smokes, here comes Garibaldi. He's going to take over the whole peninsula. So he acts in reaction to Garibaldi. Um, that's the last question I see. And it's been about 30 minutes. Sorry, this was not as smooth as they've gone in the past. I was having these tech issues at the beginning. But we've got time for one or two more questions. If you guys have anything else you want to ask me. Frankfurt assembly. Yes. So Frankfurt is like smack in the middle of Germany here. Uh, Berlin is over there. Um, so Berlin's pretty far east. Frankfurt was much more central. Um, and it's not in the same like um, region as, or what do they call them? They're the federal states of Germany. Like, like we have Colorado as a state, right? They've got states in Germany too. Um, I'm just blanking on what the word is right now. And um, Alexis, I just did the Battle of Sedan. If you want to just to cover over a couple of minutes. Um, okay, so the Frankfurt Assembly, when all of these revolutions break out across Europe in 1848, in Frankfurt, they um, end up having this two goals. One, we want to liberalize the government and uh, allow for more elections, they want to have a constitution and so on. They put out this declaration of the rights of the German peoples in December of 1848, um, similar to the declaration of the rights of man, right? And really a lot of similar ideas. Um, in, they also then are trying to figure out, well, how could we unify Germany? And then they deal with the whole Grossdeutsch versus Kleindeutsch question, like should they unify with or without Austria? Um, there's more that happens there at Frankfurt. There's some, um, the, the Prussian, uh, Kaiser Frederick Wilhelm IV isn't super excited about its existence because he doesn't, 
He doesn't particularly want a parliament. He doesn't want to give up that power. Um, but he seems to at first be cooperating with them um, until he changes his mind and basically he's able to control the outbreaks of revolution in Berlin. And once he's able to control that, then he'll come in and dissolve the Frankfurt parliament. Um, this was after they had offered him the, the German throne. And he said, I won't take your crown from the gutter. Okay, I'm going to just answer these last questions on the list here. Battle of Sedan, I said we just did that a minute ago. Uh, Roll of the Carbonari, those are very early Italian nationalist groups. Uh, really, mostly, largely, uh, really, mostly, largely, wow, good English here at 7.40 at night. Um, the Carbonari are trying to get rid of Austrian control. That's their big thing, right? They're anti-Austrian nationalists, but that's important because it's really gonna develop that Italian nationalist feeling. And of course the word Carbonari just means coal men because a lot of the people uh, who were active in the Carbonari were literally coal miners uh, working in Austrian controlled mines in Northern Italy. Luis, I would say this test is the hardest test that has ever been created. Just kidding. I th I don't think it's that bad. Um, Alexis, I would just know that the Bourbons were in charge of the southern states in the Italian peninsula, so Naples and Sicily. Uh, you'll be fine, Luis. You got this. All right. Uh, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to end the stream, and then I'm going to archive it, but I'm going to go cut off like the first two minutes of silence where I was kind of waiting for people to get on. So... Um, good luck guys and have a good night and I'll see you. I hope, well, maybe not on Wednesday. I don't know what the snow, it sounds like though it's supposed to start Wednesday night, so it might not even affect us. So have a good day and I'll see you Wednesday. Bye.